see everyone except for Andrew. It's kind of easy with a class this small. Um, you should have some scores now in Moodle because they have the graded first quiz and the graded, well, first of everything, the labs graded, the whole nine yards. Um, these are the forms for the potential test question. So I'm just going to pass a few around. Just take some, keep them in your book or whatever, so each class period you can pull one out. And for each class period, you need to make up a question there that's a multiple choice question. So it shouldn't be yes or no or true or false. It should be multiple choice. That's over the material that I lectured on. Not just from the textbook. In fact, if it's from the textbook, you'll get a zero for originality. It needs to be something that you thought of based on what we talked about in lecture. So at the end of today's lecture, when you leave, make sure you turn it in. Because I'm going to take them over to DaVinci's this afternoon, and I'm going to grade them. Here, Andy, you have some of these. These are the forms for turning your potential test questions. Cool. So the first one will be due today. Okay, any questions about that potential test question? No, excellent. Okay, we're going to talk about the scope of physics. By the way, get your clickers out because we're going to have a clicker question within the next like three slides. And it is channel 33, so you can get on the right channel. We're going to start talking about the scientific method. I'm going to put the channel number here again so you just have it there in case you're not remembering. We've already brought it up the first day of class. Of course, second day of class, it was just that little test thing, so you only had one day, really. Going over this again, why is this important? For, for me, why is it important that you learn? Well, it's more so you understand what science is really about. Right? This method is not the physics method. It's not specific to a physics class. It's specific to all sciences. This is how science develops an understanding of how the world works. And so it basically is a specific philosophy on truth. I, when I was in college, absolutely hated the whole idea of philosophy. To me, philosophy was people sitting around asking dorky questions like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Oh, dude, dude. Until, of course, Bart Simpson answered that. I don't know if you've seen it, but Bart Simpson goes, ah, it's easy. Yeah, it's down to one hand clapping. Um, you know, can, can God make a rock so heavy that he can't move it? You know, those kinds of questions are what I thought philosophy was. Well, philosophy is not really about that. Those are questions that certain schools of philosophy ask because they're apparently deep for some people. But to me, they're, they're useless. Um, but philosophy is how you discern truth. And one of your homework questions asks for differentiation between religion and science. So science is based on this process. If something can't be tested, it's not scientific. If it's not based on scientific ideas, it's not scientific. And so science is kind of limited. I was talking with Carrie Wolf and we were joking, is there truth outside of science? No. Of course there's truth outside of science. This is only one way of discerning truth, and there are some things that this simply doesn't work with. And one of those is religion. Religion, you know, I'm obviously a Baptist Christian, so I believe the Bible, I believe that we have the divine word of God that is truthful. Well, logically, that's an appeal to authority. It's a logical flaw to say, well, God said that he made the world, so he did. Right? Because what you're doing is, you, in, in a court of law, that would be hearsay. You know, you don't have actual evidence of it. You have just somebody's word for it. But as a Christian, that's what I believe. So like, you had a homework question that was, what differentiates science and religion? There are two answers that I accept as perfectly good. One is the appeal to authority. Now, science is also an appeal to authority. If Albert Einstein said it was true, I'm going to have a hard time disagreeing because he is so highly esteemed, in my opinion. 
And you might have heard people talk about, you know, climate change. And they say 97% of um, climate researchers agree that the climate is changing because of man. That is not a statement that logically means you should accept that man is responsible for climate change. That's what we call an appeal to authority. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't have any weight with you, but it's not a, a logical statement. So we have appeals to authority in both science and religion. But religion is pretty much untestable. You cannot go and test to see if God created the heavens and the earth. There's no experiment you can do. And that makes it fundamentally non-scientific. So, these steps you need to have memorized, right? There's not that much we ask you to memorize in a physics class. We're asking a lot more for thinking. But you need to memorize these steps. Know that the hypothesis, what does hypothesis mean? An educated guess. Your educated guess needs to explain why the observation occurred, and it needs to be based on scientific ideas, and it needs to make predictions that can be tested. Now, last class period, well, first class period, I used this tile that's discolored as an example. I, I observed something interesting, and then I came up with a hypothesis that was based on scientific ideas. Well, I had you guys help me with this. Andrew gave us some tests for how we could test the predictions of that hypothesis. And if our hypothesis passed the test, where do we go in the scientific process? The good news is not back to the beginning. <laughs> but you do just go back and you make another test of maybe another prediction or testing a prediction in a different way. If your test fails, your hypothesis fails the test, well, then you have disproven your hypothesis. In science, you can disprove a hypothesis. You can never prove it right. So if you disprove it, now you have more information about what it's not. You go back up here, and you develop a new hypothesis with the new information. So when is this process done? Never. The scientific process is never done. Really exciting news for somebody who goes to graduate school in the sciences. You start a research project, and somewhere a year or two later, you realize, wait a minute. I've already completed everything that I set out to do, but I have a bigger job left than I had said, you know, what I started with. Because the process never ends. It just keeps moving on and on as you develop more and more knowledge. And so it can get kind of frustrating because you have to realize, okay, we just have to put a stopping point or I'm never leaving school. So the scientific process never ends. So does that mean that there is no gravitational force that's going to make this fall? Since the process is never done, I can never prove there is a gravitational force that's going to make it fall. Does that mean that there, it doesn't exist? No, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And in fact, we have studied this phenomenon so many times, so many experiments, millions upon millions of experiments, that at this point, we've gone from calling it a hypothesis to calling it a theory, you know, something that we have very strong faith in. Still faith, but we have very strong faith and we would just be flabbergasted, shocked, if it failed. So we can't say it's proven science, but we can say it's beyond anyone's imagination that it's false. The same argument is made about evolutionary theory. Some scientists have proclaimed that it is equal with Newton's laws in terms of, sure, it's not proven correct, but we'd be flabbergasted if it was wrong. But that's more a statement of, a, of faith than it is of fact, you know, that, well, let's not get into a discussion of origins. If you want a discussion of origins and philosophy at 1.30 today, there will be a lecture on philosophy specific to origins class. At room 1.30, I'm going to be there. I'm not teaching it. All right, our first clicker question. At what point is the scientific method complete?
Are there three people without clickers? Who doesn't have a clicker? Just so I can keep one. That's two. There should be one more. Well, I got to move on. Okay, so the answers we got were, thankfully, that's a good sign. That means that actually everybody was listening or already knew. Many times I get to this question and the answers are all over the board. And I'm like, but I did just say. So thank you for listening. All right. Now, three or four slides that look exactly the same, just different words to reiterate things the hypothesis has to satisfy. An acceptable hypothesis has to agree with your observation, right? It, it has to say, this is why would I observe Kurt? So, of course, it has to agree with your observation. But it also has to make predictions that you can test. It has to make predictions separate from what you observed, right? You can't just make it circular. I observed this, so my hypothesis is what I observed occurs because of this. Now let's go back and see if what I observed really happens. That doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't move your knowledge forward. So it has to make different predictions that can be tested. Now, I'm pretty sure there's one more slide on this, but before I go forward, in case I'm wrong, let me talk about this picture here. It's just indicating the circular nature of science that it's never going to end. The process doesn't end. You have your hypothesis. It makes predictions, so you do experiments to test those predictions. You look at the results of your experiments. You consider if you need to change your hypothesis or not. Then you do another experiment, and you just keep going around a circle. That's what that picture is indicating. Like I said, I think there's one more, yeah. This part here, an acceptable hypothesis must stand up to criticism. Now, you all are far younger than me. Very that statement. When I was in graduate school, I remember quite clearly the day, I don't remember the day, but I remember the day that Pons and Fleischmann made the announcement that they had successfully experimentally produced cold fusion in the laboratory. Man, things were all fluttering in the physics department. And a person who did research in that area went out and bought the equipment to try to reproduce it. Because what science does, let us say you are a scientist and you discover something new. The method that you're supposed to go through in science is you test it a lot. You don't just say, ha, publish. You test it. You make sure you're right. And then after doing all your testing, when you're really sure you're right, you write a paper. Or you go get a presentation at a conference. And you tell other people, this is the experiment I did. This is how I did it. This is the result I got. And this is the interpretation. And then you stand back and wait for the feces to fly. Because everybody's going to say, no, that didn't make any sense. You must have done this wrong. Or you must have done this wrong. And that's where the criticism part comes in. People are going to try to dissect your work and see where you made a mistake. Why? Not because they don't like you. It's not personal. It's because they want to know the truth. You have given them something that suggests a new breakthrough, and they want to make sure that it's correct before they just jump in with both feet and say, Woohoo, we've got it. Well, Pons and Fleischmann, they broke the rule. They went straight to the public media. They didn't test and retest. They didn't go to a conference or publish a paper. They just went straight to the media and said, look what we've got. And so, of course, the scientists are all going crazy, and they start the process of trying to reproduce it. And you probably at least know what happened. No one was ever re able to reproduce their experiments. And so the scientific consensus is they're wrong. What, what they actually had. Okay, you guys, do you know what cold fusion is? Yeah, I probably need to be a little more specific before I talk. Okay, cold fusion is fusing hydrogen into helium. That's what goes on in the sun to make all the energy that comes out of the sun. But doing it in an environment where it's not an explosion. Right, the sun is a major explosion. If we drop an atomic bomb that is a, a hydrogen fusion bomb, just call it a hydrogen bomb, it goes boom, <laughs> and it's not controlled. And so there is extensive research done around the world 
trying to find a way to take this process of combining protons together, ultimately you have four protons to make one helium nucleus, it releases a lot of energy to use that so we can just take the heat, the hydrogen in the water in the oceans and produce energy for, you know, a very large number of years. Huge amounts of money spent on that. And so what they said is, by just having this palladium thing, that's a piece of metal, and putting it in a certain liquid and putting certain voltage across it, we were able to cause hydrogen to fuse into helium. And how did they know? Because they had left their experiment running, they went home and they came back the next day, and they melted a hole through the concrete floor. And they said the only way we could have melted a hole through the concrete floor was if we had fusion occurring for that energy release. That was their evidence. Yeah. So that's a, a major failure. It didn't stand up to criticism. Now I'll give you another major failure, well, a failure that didn't stand up to criticism that went the right way. You may or may not have heard an announcement last year about neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light. Neutrinos are really tiny particles that are flying through you all the time. Neutrinos are flying through you, they don't bother you. They're really small and they have no charge. They don't interact with you, they just go through. Well, they did experiments. I saw an XKCD cartoon a couple days ago that was talking about this. That's why it's at the top of my head. They did some experiments where they were sending a beam of neutrinos through the Earth, because it goes right through most things, and then detecting them. And their measurements indicated that the neutrinos were going faster than the speed of light. A fundamental principle of physics is that nothing can go faster than the speed of light in vacuum. And so these guys spent like nine months analyzing and redoing the experiment, trying to cover all the bases. And then they you know, went through the scientific process of presenting their research. And everybody was like, wow, that doesn't make sense. They started trying to analyze it. And in the end, it turned out they were wrong. They were wrong because the wire wasn't connected properly. Imagine the disappointment. You spent nine months doing everything the right way, but you had a wire that wasn't connected right. And it was a wire that synchronized the clock, and so the clock was off a little bit. OK, so that's what the criticism part is. Now let's take somewhere where it worked, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, you probably know basics of Albert Einstein. You know, he went to school, great student, could care less about the teachers and their stupid agendas and the assignments they gave. So he, you know, didn't get the highest grades. You've heard him talk about, well, you haven't heard him talk, but you've heard people talk about his problems with math. He just didn't like math. How many people here like math? I do. I love it. When I was, like, in grade school, I would work math problems for a few grades above me while I was riding the bus to school and back because it was fun. Einstein wasn't like me. He didn't like math. So what do you do if you don't like a class? Einstein just didn't go. So he didn't go to his math class. And then the night before his test, he had a buddy who turned out to be a math genius say, OK, you need to learn this, this, and this for the test tomorrow. And he passed his math test, which to me indicates that he was really good at math, just didn't like it. Okay. So, after he finished school, he got a job working in the patent office where he got to look at people's ideas and try to see if they worked, do the criticism thing. And he and his pals would get together in the, after, or in the evenings at the pub for a pint of root beer and read the scientific publications and laugh at people and, and tear them up, do the criticism thing. But then in 1905, Einstein had a really, really good year. He wrote three papers. Each one of those papers, by itself, was probably worthy of the Nobel Prize. The first paper was, well, not chronological order, but just the first one I'm going to talk about, was on the theory of special relativity. Special relativity is the theory that allows us to understand how you can have energy produced by merging protons and making a helium and a lot of other things. It allows us to use GPS systems. Without special relativity, we would, actually without general relativity, we'd be completely in the dark on how the GPS thing works. He wrote a paper on what's called Brownian motion. An American scientist, Robert Brown, looking at little floating pollen, floating in water, 
saw that the palm was going like this, vibrating. And he was like, what's causing that? It must be, quote, cavorting beasties, end quote. In other words, he suggested it was microscopic life forms that were pushing on it. And Einstein said, no, 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 no. It's a um, kinetic theory of materials that the water, while the water seems still, the molecules are flying around, bouncing off of things. And what he was seeing, the pollen was so low in mass that he was seeing the pollen respond to individual water molecules hitting it. That was the second thing. And his third one, the one for which he got the Nobel Prize, was on the photoelectric effect. Now, we will learn about light. In the early days, Newton has said light is like a particle. So light is kind of like a ball or the stopper. So if light comes at you, ready, Henry? Light's going to come at you. If light comes at you, it hits you, you know, it hits you. And that's how we're detecting. We're detecting things hitting us. But then Thomas Young did an experiment where he saw that light was behaving like a wave instead of like a particle. And so with his experimental evidence that showed that light was not consistent with particle behavior, everybody said, aha, light is a wave, not a particle. But then Einstein, with his photoelectric effect, said, no, light really does behave like a particle. And he provided an experiment for people to test. Now, Einstein was not an experimentalist. In lab, you do some experiments, or you will. Einstein, as far as we know, never did a single experiment. But he did do what we call gedanken experiments. Experiments of the mind, where he thought things through. I was super smart. And so he proposed an experiment where people could test his new hypothesis. And people tested it, and the prediction he made was what the experiment turned out to show, rather than the prediction that would be made if light was away. And so people had to accept Einstein's new theory because when they tried to poke holes in it, they couldn't. That's the way science is supposed to work. But even the failures lead to further understanding because you learn what's not correct. <laughs> Good. My tablet had turned off. I spent too much time talking out there. Okay. That spirit of inquiry is so important. You had another homework problem about the cell phone. You know, you go through things all the time. What's not working? My brother and I were driving to the Raiders' last home game, half hour from the stadium. The car stopped working. And so we sit there and we try to figure out what's wrong with it. Of course, we can't figure out what's wrong with it. The mechanic says that it was the timing chain, but I don't think that's right. What's important is that we missed Charles Woodson's last home game. We missed our catered tailgate party because we won the Raiders tailgate party competition. We missed that. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, but we use the scientific method in some fashion all the time, even when you're not thinking about science. You're looking at, well, I see something interesting. What could it be? And then you try seeing if that's what it is. So in this case, the gentleman notices his coffee worker isn't, or coffee worker, coffee maker isn't working. And so he's all, hmm, what could be wrong? Somewhere in his lizard brain, he thinks maybe there's a wire that's not connected. So maybe if I bang on it, I'll make that wire shake into the right position to make a connection and work. It works sometimes. When I was a kid and our TV would be a malfunction, my dad would do what he called fine-tuning, come up and give it a whack upside, and it usually fixed it. So that's what he's doing. Something that I find humorous, you have the same figure in your textbook except for one difference. They changed it from a man to a woman. In science, it turns out we have a lot more men than women in science. The popular theory, at least by Priscilla Laws, is that it's because of that criticism part of science. According to her, men don't mind being criticized as much as women. I disagree because I'm a very sensitive soul. But at any rate, things like that, changing a figure to show a woman instead of a man, is done intentionally to try to make sure everybody realizes that science is open to everybody. We don't want just pictures of men in the books. We want pictures of men and pictures of women. I find it funny, though, that we have to go through and change the figures 
to make sure people realize that. Okay, the scope of physics. That was the title of today's lecture. Since we're halfway through, it's good that I get to it. So what is, this, what is physics? Physics is studying how nature works. And this on the first page is listing sciences. These are not all in physics. These are sciences. So you have the life sciences. Right now, for general education requirements, you're required to take a life science class and a physical science class. If you use the GE package that will be adopted sometime soon, you'll just have to take a science class. It won't have to be one and the other, or just be, take one. <laughs> Don't go drop now, though, because I want you to be in my class. Um, <laughs> so life sciences is studying, obviously, living things. So biology, that's the study of living things. Also health-related things like medicine. Medicine is professional biology, if you will. It's a life science. Dentistry, nursing, those are life sciences. Then we have the physical sciences, studying physical things in nature. And so there we have physics, which we physicists loudly proclaim is the most fundamental science. You know, other people do disagree with us. And it's kind of unimportant to argue. But physics includes the entire world in what it studies. And other things like chemistry, well, they take a piece of it. Geology takes a piece of it. And so that's why we say it's the most fundamental. So we have physics. We're going to be studying why things work around us. Chemistry. Chemistry started as a subfield of physics studying how atoms interact. And it turned out to be pretty complicated, so it got split off as its own thing. Geology is studying how the earth processes work. And so we have things like forces that cause pieces of the earth to move. And then we have earthquakes and you know, mountains that grow because of those forces. Talking about forces is very definitely a physics thing, but physicists cut off that area and say, okay, that's geology, that's using physics to study how the earth works. Astronomy, of course, is using physics to discover how the cosmos work. So these, in my mind, are all physics, but there's special areas of physics that are so large that they have their own title. Now we're going to look at some of the Functions, or the nature of physics, and then some of the sub-areas. So, what we're doing in physics is studying the most basic nature of matter. We're looking at, fundamentally, why things happen. I was just talking to Dr. Osborne, chemistry professor, yesterday, about energy and forces. And when I was a high school and college student, I thought of forces as the most important thing for why things happen. You know, you push on something, it moves. To me, that was the most fundamental thing. But as I've been teaching, I've been learning more and more about the intricacies of my subject, and I, now I think much more about the energies involved than the forces, that the forces are a result of the energies. And so, you know, you're, you're thinking about these, and it, it gets very complicated. You're not going to get to any of the deep, complicated stuff. Not like this class is going to be easy. Something that you might wonder is the difficulty of this compared to the difficulty of general physics. You cover essentially the same material in the two classes. The difference is, in general physics, you cover it this deep, and it takes two semesters to get through it. In this class, we only cover it this deep, and it only takes one semester to get through it. So we're covering basically the same material, less depth going through faster. I know it doesn't seem like anything's going to go fast the way I've been lecturing today, but, yeah, topics will come, topics will go. Okay, so I've already talked about the fundamental part. It's very quantitative. Quantitative means number-oriented. We make specific measurements, and then we use math on those measurements. So that means that math is a fundamental, integral part of physics. I have another slide that talks about that, so I won't go further on that until I get there. Physics... The goal of physics is to describe things in very simple and clean methods. Clean method means you don't have a lot of wishy-washy, well, maybe. It, you know, if this happens, then that must happen. 
and it's most definitely not a collection of memorized facts. On the test, you will have all the equations and all the numbers you need. The only things that you have to have memorized are things like that scientific method and things like prefixes for numbers. You know, you have to know what micro means and centa means. But generally everything else, it's going to be your thinking process that's being studied rather than anything else. Now some subfields within physics. Classical physics. Classical physics means physics before 1905. What happened in 1905? Einstein happened in 1905. Those three papers. So Einstein marks the separator between classical physics, the old stuff, and modern physics, the new stuff. In the 1900s, physicists thought that they understood everything. A pretty silly attitude when you think about it. But there are famous physicists who are on record saying, we pretty much understand everything. All that remains to be discovered in physics is maybe extending the physical constants by a decimal place or two. And then in 1905, just a few years after people were saying those things, Einstein comes up with these new ideas that just turned physics on its head. And so modern physics is <laughs> these new ideas. Does that mean we've got it all under control now? No. We would be as silly as the physicists 100 years ago if we said, oh yeah, now we understand it all. How silly they were, but now we've got it. We think we have it, that there could be another paradigm shift with somebody coming up with a new understanding that shifts how we understand all of it. When I say it that way, it does seem a little depressing. I'm going to teach you all these things, but I'm telling you they may not be true. They're true to the best of our knowledge following the scientific method. But following the scientific method, you could always come up with the experiment that disproves it. And if that happens, we have to accept and, and refine our ideas. So within classical mechanics, or classical physics, the first thing we're going to study is mechanics, which is how, how things move and what makes them move. That's going to be the focus for the next few weeks, how things move and what makes them move. That was always my favorite area of physics. I was naive enough as a college student to ask my advisor, could I get a PhD in classical physics? He laughed at me. No, no, you can't. You, you, you can't get a PhD in that. You have to do something that's specialized. Getting a PhD, you may or may not know, means that you have advanced the knowledge. Things that were not known to man, you have discovered. And, you know, how things move is pretty well known to man. Okay, next one, thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is studying how heat affects things. It also has another name, statistical physics, because what you're doing is applying statistics to a very large number of particles to figure out what's going to happen. And so an example here of thermodynamics is a heat engine. Your automobile, unless it's an electric vehicle, has a heat engine in there. You burn gasoline, and that releases a lot of heat. Heat is energy transfer. And that causes gas to expand, and that expanding gas pushes a piston, and that piston that got pushed makes your car move. That's an example of thermodynamics. Optics. Well, electricity and magnetism is the next one on the list. Electricity and magnetism, well, obviously you know what electricity is and magnets are. That's an area of very careful study in physics. It's actually very complicated. Then we have optics. Optics is actually a part of electricity and magnetism. Light is an electromagnetic wave. So optics is a specialty area within electricity and magnetism. But it's so broad that we give it its own group instead of saying, well, it's electricity and magnetism. Then we have our modern physics. Things that are possible basically because of Einstein. 
Atomic physics, understanding what's going on inside the atoms. Nuclear physics, well, atomic physics is understanding, yeah, they're related. Nuclear physics is what's happening in the center of the atom. Condensed matter physics, technically that's what my PhD is in. In case you care, I got my PhD in vaporizing transparent materials with a laser. Um, it's a condensed matter area I was looking at, transparent solids. And then particle physics, you've probably heard of the Higgs boson, it's been in the news a lot. That is particle physics, the Higgs boson is a mathematical calculation of a particle that must exist that is related to why we have mass. Okay, next clicker question. Don't answer yet, I've got to move this forward. Okay, now you can answer. Which subfield of physics studies forces and motion? Should we get it at least one more? Oh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to move forward. One last person had answered, but can't wait forever. So we had six people that said mechanics, and that is correct. So mechanics is studying how forces of motion occur. Why did I ask that specifically? Because that's what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. Um, interdisciplinary fields. These are sciences that are split between biophysics. That's studying how physics relates to biology. Geophysics, how physics relates to geology. Astrophysics, how physics relates to astronomy, not to astrology. <laughs> Even my mom has asked, you know, so what do you teach in your astrology class? Don't teach astrology. Now, this here is a separate thing. It's not part of what's above. A differentiation between a physicist and an engineer. I'm the only physics teacher here. Dr. Seth McNeil is the only engineering teacher here. And sometimes people get confused between physics and engineering. What we study has a lot of overlap. But the goal of physics is knowledge. So physicists are trying to find new knowledge about how nature works. Then you have the engineers. Their goal is applications. Which of these can you sell for a lot of money? In general, applications. Now, you can patent it, you know, certain pieces of knowledge. But in general, the applications are much more valuable because people want to buy them. And so there's actually a lot more money in engineering than in physics. Engineers are using the knowledge that the physicist gives them to produce useful products. They're applying the knowledge. And so, you know, if I'd gone into it for the money, I'd be an engineer. <laughs> engineering requires a lot of creativity because you're finding creative solutions. Physics requires creativity because you're finding new information, trying to understand how it, you know, why it comes about. All right, measurements. Measurements are extremely important in physics. We had our first lab on measurements, and you learned to use the Vernier calipers, and you learned about uncertainties. In this diagram here, you have a gentleman shooting a cannon, and then another guy measuring how far it travels. Is he going to have the correct distance exactly? No. So when they do this, he's going to have to have an estimate of his uncertainty, how much he could have been off. And you make those measurements very carefully so you can analyze your data and try to organize and figure out patterns. And those patterns are what we describe with mathematical equations in physics. Now the math part. Math is our language. I rattle off equations all the time. And I look at an equation and it means something to me. So to me, equations are like, you know, 
works of art. They're, I see all these nuances in them. Now, I recognize for most students taking this class, that's not the case. For most students taking this class, they're not really comfortable with describing something with seven variables, just A, B, C, D, E. And so an example I think that's in the preface of our textbook is, you know, just some gibberish written out there. And it says to the teacher, this is what your equations look like to your students. I understand that. I try to make sure that we have defined what we have in equations and how they work out. But it is something you're going to have to develop a certain ability to work with. And the example here that's given to illustrate how the mathematical relationships are useful are like, you know, you have a pancake recipe, and this recipe feeds three people. But let's say you have a fourth person coming over. How are you going to make your recipe so it feeds four people instead of three people? Okay, so you, you take each thing, so if it, if it required two eggs, now you have two times four-thirds, eight-thirds eggs, hmm, let's go with three, right? You have to make some approximations there, but you can use the, the proportions to scale up the recipe. Now keep in mind that cooking is not what I do, and I do recognize that you can't just double every ingredient in a recipe and have a proper recipe sometimes. You know, a little yeast goes a long way. If you double the yeast, you're going to have a problem type of thing. But being a physicist, I don't worry about that. I go out to eat. Well, I did go out to eat. Then I got married. I eat at home. My wife cooks. Okay. In physics, we have fundamental units. I think there's seven total fundamental units. There are only three fundamental units that we're going to work with for the first half of the class. There will be a few more coming up at the very end. Well, ampere. So things we measure in physics, we measure the time. You did that in lab. The unit for time is the second. That is our standard. What is the definition of the second, you ask? Well, most people think we have a day. We divide that day into 24 hours. And then we divide the hours into minutes and seconds, 60 minutes and an hour, 60 seconds and a minute. And that's how we get the second. But there's some inherent problems there. Like Every day is not the same length, right? We, we tend to think of a day as 24 hours. The average, the mean solar day is 24 hours from noon to noon. But it's not exact, and in fact, it varies because of Earth's variations. You know, like when you had the earthquake in uh, 2004 or something that caused the major tsunamis, um, you had the ocean floor shifted by something like 10 meters. That's a huge distance. And it was enough to change the length of a day by a measurable, very tiny amount. And so that doesn't really work out. It's not super reproducible. In science, we want our units to be really reproducible. So the standard for the second is the, <laughs> the time it takes for that ridiculously large number of cycles of a specific cesium-133 emission line. Atoms have very specific frequencies that they will produce if you excite electrons and they fall back down. And so they're using that fact to define what a second is. Why that definition? Because it's really reproducible. You could take the cesium-133, go to any place in the world, make this measurement, and know exactly what a second is. Then we have the meter. Now, lengths is an interesting history. We all are familiar with the foot, right? How long is a foot? Well, you know, about that long. Okay, my foot's a little longer. From what I've understood, it depended on who was the ruler. It was the length of his foot. You know, a yard was, what, the distance from the nose to the, the fingertips of the king. You know, they, they weren't very well reproduced. Tell me what you know about Napoleon's height. Okay, he was short. How tall was he? I 
I think he was something like 5'4 or 5'5, five, five, using the French inch and foot. And the French inch and foot in that time would translate to 5'9 with what we use for feet and inches now, which for his time was taller than average. So people talk about Napoleon being short and having Napoleon complex, but he was taller than the average Frenchie at the time. Um, so <clears throat> this system was really convoluted because you have, you know, as things got formalized, three feet in yard and 5,280 feet in a mile and just ridiculous numbers. Who wants to memorize all of that? Yeah, not me either. And so, so scientists said, okay, let's come up with something that's really reasonable. Let's take the distance from the equator to the North Pole going along the prime meridian and divide that by, I forget what the number is. I think it was like divided by a thousand, that's a kilometer or something like that. And so they set two scientists up to determine what that distance is and they came up with the distance. That actually, they knew they made a mistake, but they just pretended they didn't. And then they drew these two marks on a bar. They said, that's a meter. And then anyone who wants to know what a meter was would have to come and bring their bar and compare and say, pretty close. Not exactly, pretty close. Okay, let's adjust a little. Well, that things expand and contract when you heat them and cool them. So they have to keep this rod that is made out of iridium platinum. They had to keep it at a constant temperature and, and all kinds of things. And they said, that's ridiculous. That's a lot of work. And so they have revised it so that the meter now as is defined as 1 divided by 29979 of the distance light travels in a second. To put that another way, what they defined is that the speed of light in vacuum is 29979 meters per second. That's now a constant. They said the speed of light is a constant. That's exactly that number. And since we know the second is reproducible, then we can use the definition of the second to determine how far light travels and get the distance for a meter. It's, again, a testable, reproducible thing that can be done anywhere in the world anytime. So that's the definition. Now, my own, own personal little quibble. This number is really, really close to 3000000000, zero, 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 right? Really close. In fact, for your work, you're just going to use it as 300 million. Why didn't the scientists say, you know, no one's going to know the difference if we move this mark on the bar by this tiny fraction. Let's make the number exactly 300 million. They just randomly chose to make it exactly this number because that's, to the best of their measurements, what the difference was between those two notches that they knew were already wrong based on their original definition. Are y'all with me? It just would have made it so easy if we just, yeah, the speed of light is 300 million meters per second, the end. But no, 29979245A meters per second. I have it memorized because, well, I teach this class over and over and over. Yeah. Okay, finally, the kilogram. The unit of mass is first confusing to students because what is mass? It's not the same as weight. Mass is a measurement of how much material is present. So, I am a large gentleman. If I go from here to the moon, I will still be a large gentleman. I will still have the same mass because I still have the same number of atoms, etc. But the weight is how hard I press down on the ground. And if I go from here to the moon, I'll weigh one-sixth as much. So you can say, ha, going to the moon, I'm going to lose weight. But it won't make me a more svelte richer. It will just make me lighter for the same mass. Mass is inherent to the material present. Weight is how hard the force is. So we don't have a good standard for mass. The standard for mass is still a chunk of platinum iridium that's held at the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. 
They have it a double vacuum chamber and there's that chunk, that's a kilogram. One thing to note, kilo, kilo is a prefix that means 1,000. So the basic unit of mass is 1,000 grams. The gram is not the fundamental unit, it's the kilogram. So when we work problems, we're going to shift our units to the kilogram rather than the gram because the kilogram is the standard unit. Now you need to know basic prefixes. You should know from giga, mega, kilo, and of course I put centi in here, milli, micro, nano. These are prefixes that mean things. Giga means a billion, which I can write like this. 10 raised to the ninth power. That means 10 multiplied by 10, a total of nine times. Or one followed by nine zeros. Mega is a million, 10 to the sixth. Kilo is a thousand, 10 to the third. Notice three zeros, 10 to the third. Centi is 10 to the minus 2. Minus 2 means it's 1 over 10 squared. So it's 1 over 1 with two zeros, 1 over 100, or 0 0.01. Milli is 10 to the minus 3, micro 10 to the minus 6, and nano 10 to the minus 9th. So that's going from billions to billionths. And notice all of them are multiples of three except for centi. Because we use centimeters so much, I want you to know what centi means. It's the only one that's not a multiple of three. Okay, our last clicker question. The standard for which fundamental, the fundamental unit cannot be replicated in the lab if needed is, so which one of these three things, well, there's four there, but only three truly exist, force, length, mass, and time, has a standard that can be, I'm sorry, I've been looking at the wrong clock. This clock here, well, yeah. Answer this and we'll go. Right now only two people have answered. Sorry, I am two minutes over apparently. At six, we have seventh, there's the seventh. Okay, so here we had four, zero, two, one. Force is not a fundamental unit. Force is a derived unit that we'll learn about next class period. So now of these fundamental units, length had a basic unit of the meter. Time had a basic unit of the second. Mass had a basic unit of the kilogram. And the kilogram is just defined as the mass of this chunk that's preserved. You can't do that in any lab. You have to go to where that chunk is. So it was the correct answer. All right, have a great long weekend, and obviously we don't have lab on Monday either, so I'll see you on Wednesday. Remember to turn in your potential test questions. Where do you want this? Uh, just set it on the table. I think I saw a YouTube video.